So uh, I'm delighted uh, to uh, welcome to uh, someone who's going to be teaching our final session of the day on IP and ethics, uh, Michael McCabe, Jr. He is the principal and founder of Michael McCabe Law, LLC. And so please join me in welcoming him. Thank you for the introduction. And thank you very much for sticking around to the end. I know it's the bottom of the ninth, and you're all ready to go home. But hopefully, this is going to be like the Nats game the other night, where we <laughs> drive home the rest of the runs over the plate and and take home a victory. And I, and and I hope you all get something out of this. And this is my first um, CPIP, and I. I since we're going to be talking about ethics for the next 15 minutes, I'm, or hour and 15 minutes, uh, I, I should start out by, by being candid, because that's one of the things that you should be as an ethical lawyer is, is honest. And I was, frankly, not all that excited this morning when I woke up, and I realized that I, I was giving this speech today, not because I didn't want to, but uh, I gave a speech yesterday in San Antonio, at the ABA meeting, and there was a lot of running around and getting back home really late, and got home at midnight last night, and finally got to sleep really late after watching that the bad game in Los Angeles that we won't talk about ever again. And when I woke up this morning, oh God, I got a million things to do, and I've got to do another speech, and 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 and, um, but oh my God, I'm so excited because. I've seen so many people here today that I haven't seen in years, of colleagues, friends, people I work against in, in cases. And so this is really a wonderful experience to, to, to see you all. And um, um, thanks again. And we're going to kind of focus, uh, change a little bit of the uh, what seems to be the, sort of the general gist of how the, the, the prior talks have been going, which are a lot on the policy side. And it's also awesome where that, I mean, at most of these bar meetings, you do not get the client perspective. You don't really get, and in the IP world, you don't get the innovator side of the story. You get the, it's all lawyers and and it's all about law, and it's not the pragmatics of things that the creative people have, that they want the lawyers help for. And so it's, it's, it's excellent to be able to, to, to see folks in here who are the actual consumers of the legal services that the lawyers in the room are able to, uh, to provide for them. Um, and I have to apologize in advance for my slides. And there's a, I'm going to make an excuse in advance. If you want to get ethics credit accredited from bar associations, they kind of require a lot of words on paper that deal with ethics rules. And it makes it show that ethics was really discussed. And so my apologies in advance. The, my slides are not as colorful as everybody else's slides. I'm not that creative. and um, We'll, we'll just bear with me, and, and we'll work through it. Um, and I'm also going to kind of address this. We've been talking a lot about, you know, sort of hearing a lot of it from the client side on the bridge from innovation to market. But what I'm really focused on, where I want to try to drive home today, is the lawyer's journey on the path with the client on this walk across the bridge. Uh, and in particular, understanding the specifics of conflicts of interests as they arise or could arise, depending upon um, the steps you take on that journey across the bridge. Um, conflicts, well, I don't want to. Let me just ask anybody here. I'm not, I've already given away the answer to the question, so I'm going to tell you the answer to the question. The number one reason that attorneys get sued for legal malpractice in the United States is conflicts of interest, actually. Something as unsexy as conflicts of interest, like, you know, who wants to hear about conflicts of interest? It's so boring. It's 4 o'clock on a, you know, Friday afternoon. Really want to talk about conflicts of interest at 4 o'clock? Well, yes. So that's what we're going to talk about, because that's what I was charged to do. But it is really important <laughs> to understand conflicts of interest, and I'm going to talk to you, it's, 
While I appreciate that the clients and the creators are in the room, the focus of this part is really on the lawyer's journey and, and things that you need to keep in mind when you're thinking about conflicts. And if you can, the, the issue that I see quite often in, in representing individuals, IP practitioners who have ethics issues that seem to under, underpin almost all conflicts analyses um, comes down to some fairly simple concepts, at least simple in, in words. Um, and that is, who's your client? Okay, we haven't really talked about that, but there's a whole world of issues that arise in dealing with and trying to understand and appreciate who's your client. Because as you cross that bridge to, from innovation and the laboratory to the marketplace, you're going to be interfacing with lots of folks along the way. You as counsel are going to be interfacing with lots of different folks along the way. Perhaps, perhaps not, but uh, when the conflicts issues arise, it is often because of people that you, uh, that come into your space, that come into your life, not in necessarily a bad way at all, not necessarily a bad way at all, um, but they become in your world. And understanding who those people are and where they fit in with what it is that you're doing for your client presupposes that you know who your client is and that you've identified that person or that entity or that thing that is your client. And you think, well, that's such a simple concept, my client is, but we'll look at some examples of how that plays out. And another thing that is also tied in as an important issue under the conflicts discussions are not just who your client is, but when does the representation end? Because in IP matters, some of these matters can last for years. Some of these matters can last for decades. And is it a fact that the client is the client of your, is a current client of yours for that entire duration of the patent term, for example, or the entire duration of the trademark that you've got registered and that every 10 years you are renewing that registration, so is that company 30 years in, having gone through multiple um, renewals of the registration, are they your cl current client all of that time? And it raises um, interesting ethical issues as well. And so we're gonna, we're gonna do a dive into some uh, hypotheticals that are um, informed by real life, <laughs> put it that way. And, uh, I, I, and this is all made up, so I don't wanna see any exhibit stamps attached to this uh, uh, presentation in any cases that I'm involved in, if it ever happens. Um, it's okay, but I wouldn't prefer that you don't mark this as an exhibit at my deposition. <laughs> um, but let's just look at some really basic fundamental things that we as lawyers know. Maybe the clients know some of these things too, but at the heart of, of, of conflicts, you've got to understand this, the two basic principles that drive conflicts analyses are the duties, there are two duties that, that we have. One is a duty of loyalty, and one is a duty of confidentiality. Now look, the first the duty, the duty of loyalty, it just means, well, kind of means what you think it means. It's a fiduciary relationship. So what does that mean? It means that when you're loyal to your client, you mean it means you have to put their client, your, their interests before your interests, or before other people's interests. Uh, you can't take actions against your client or think, do things that are against the interests of your client um, because to do so, it would question your loyalty. How dare you do that? 
disloyal. Um, and so loyalty is a fundamental underpinning of the conflict's rules. And the second underpinning of the conflict's rules is the duty to keep everything we learn from our clients secret, at least to the extent that it needs to be secret until such point in time where it needs to go public, which as often as not in the case with IP, at some point down the road of a representation where things have become secret, they eventually become public, but yet there's an overriding expectation that clients have that their lawyers are going to be their secret keepers, right? I mean, it's fundamental to the lawyer-client relationship that the client can come to us and we want to promote them and encourage them to, to, to tell all, we need to know the information, right? So give it to us, good, bad, ugly, whatever it is, we need to know the information. And it's in the vault. Clients understand, have to understand and they have to trust that when they tell, uh, when they tell you their secrets. And I've, I've early in my career, I, I, I dealt with individual inventors and, and others and I was frankly shocked at how the level of distrust that was inherent in just the client wanting to disclose even to me what their invention was. They wanted me to sign, them in, sign an NDA and uh, agree to a confidentiality agreement. I said, well, I could do all those things, but you, you, know, you do realize that it is my professional obligation to, uh, I don't trust anybody. And so clients demand confidentiality and it encourages the free flow of information, and so confidentiality and loyalty are the underpinnings. Now, the duty of loyalty, it doesn't last forever, okay? The duty of loyalty, it, it's a rule that protects current clients. And I put quotes around current because, as we will see in some of the examples I lay out, oftentimes, it's not all that clear who's a current client and who's not a current client. Uh, but if it is a current client, you have a duty of loyalty to that client as long for the time that they are a current client. Um, the confidentiality provisions, it doesn't matter whether they're current or not current. You have a duty of, so once you, your client actually becomes a former client, you have no longer have a duty of loyalty to them any further, but you do still have a duty of confidentiality, okay? That duty of confidentiality surpasses, it, it, it goes past any of that, um, and it's there to make sure that the, that the attorney doesn't use that information they learned in their former representation of their former client in a way that's against the interests of an adverse to their former client. And why should we worry about it? Well, besides the fact that it's a leading malpractice claim, it, conflicts of interest could give rise to various bad things that can happen in your life that you don't want to have happen in your life. There could be referrals to bar counsel. Um, there could be claims that, uh, to return your fees that you earned. Uh, there could be disqualification motions filed. There can be negative publicity. Uh, doesn't help with the client relations. Um, and there's also a very personal, and uh, uh, there's a toll both on the person, the subject of the conflict's claim, the attorney who's accused of a conflict's violation. I work with these folks every day. And I can, I empathize with their, their fears and their concerns and their worries, and I see it. You know, I've been practicing law for so many years, and nothing like this has ever happened, and I never intended to do, you know, they are stressed. They are worried, as they should be, because the bar takes conflicts very seriously, and people take conflicts very seriously. And if anyone here reads um, I, uh, Law 360, there's a Legal Ethics 360, and I'd say probably every day there's pretty much a, some article about some lawyer who is, done, is being accused of or is found to have done something that violated their conflict of interest duties. And so that's not the kind of attention that you or your firm or your anybody wants to really see about themselves. And it 
There's other ancillary effects, of course. There, besides the stress, there's the cost and the time and the distraction and all those other things. So there's lots of good things to worry about uh, in why do we avoid, uh, why we care so much about the topic. And uh, one of the issues that, uh, so what we want to understand too is, again, for the groundwork, for the purposes of the examples I'm about to give, there's a couple of foundational things for those of you in the room who don't know, I'm just going to go through this rather quickly. Um, what is that test for determining whether there's a, uh, a, what I'll call a representational conflict of interest between a lawyer and a current client? We're going to assume this client is current. Uh, it's a conflict if you represent one client directly adverse to another client. All right, that makes sense. That's pretty easy to follow, right? I mean. It's in, okay, I don't really have any problems with that, and it's pretty straightforward. And most people, those are the ones that you kind of know it when you, you know it when you see it. They're not, often not a lot of gray area. Um, if you're representing somebody directly adverse to somebody else, um, it's going to become pretty apparent. The second type of a current conflict isn't so black and white. There's a lot of gray area in it, in my opinion, anyway, and that is the test is that there's a significant risk. So there's no direct adversity per se. But there's a significant risk that the representation of a client will be materially limited by the lawyer's responsibilities to someone or something else. Okay? And that someone or something else could be the lawyer's own personal interests or the lawyer's own business interests. It could be the interests of a third party. It could be really the interests of anything. You can get very creative into thinking about what types of things would be uh, potentially influence somebody's objectivity and their duties to their clients that could interfere with that because they've somehow gotten themselves involved in the, in the relationship um, that causes a concern. And what's really problematic about this particular rule is that, you know, we've got these we lawyer words in here, significant risk. Okay, so if it's not a significant risk, uh, then you're okay. But who wants to litigate the issue of whether a risk is significant or insignificant? Uh, and even, even, even more interesting is the materially limited part. So if you're just limited, but it's not materially limited, you're okay. Again, who's going to tell you that it's materially limited versus not materially limited? Do you really want to go to a hearing and have a judge decide that or a tribunal decide that at some point, whether it's materially limited? You really want to risk, your, put your license on the line, arguing over, well, you know, material, it wasn't really material. It was, you know, nobody really wants to do that. So it's, a, it's concerning. There's no good answer to it, but this is, the, this is just the groundwork. This is what we're working from. There are also other ways that we can have conflicts that don't necessarily involve the, um, or that can be sort of maybe examples of situations while they're spelled out in different rules of the types of things that could be considered conflicts uh, and maybe even under the materially limited prong, but um, the ones that seem, in, in my experience, that seem to be the most common that come up are things such as, well, let's say you acquire an ownership interest and in you, counsel, acquire an ownership interest, an equity interest in the client or the client's entity or the client's IP. Uh, you, as part of the, your engagement with the client, you've entered into an agreement of somehow to, to uh, uh, exercise a lien on the client's uh, IP to, in order to secure payment of your fee. Um, you, attorney, are being paid by somebody who isn't the client. Well, that means A, you need to know who the client is, and B, you got to know who's paying you, and C, you've got to know what's the relationship between the two. And if any one of you ever deal with insurance companies, you have insurance companies all the time who are third-party payers. Right? The more classic situation is if, if I'm an insurance defense lawyer, 
I'm representing the, ins the, the, the ins if, if, I'm, if I am being paid to represent an insured who has been sued, say an auto tort case, I get hired by State Farm to represent John Doe in their auto tort case, um, my client isn't necessarily State Farm. My client is at the very least, my client's the, uh, the tortfeasor, or the accused tortfeasor, or the person whose legal interests are at stake. And yet, there's State Farm sticking their you know, beak in and dictating what my fees are, requiring me to sign on to you know, agreements that, that make them, you know, give them a lot of authority and purport to provide control. And, and so third-party payments of fees, if it's, it could even be you know, parents paying the fees for their kid. It doesn't really, it can come up in any different context. Someone other than the client paying your fees. Another issue where someone could say, well, you know, you were really more concerned about getting paid than you really were about the interests of your client, and therefore, you kind of pulled your punches for your client. You didn't do everything you wanted to do because you were really serving the paymaster. And I gotta tell you, in, in my practice in IP law and working in some big IP firms, it, is, it, it has always amazed me at how uh, partners and, and, and firm management have considered the payors to be the client. And it would drive me crazy, because I would have to deal with conflicts checks all of the time and try to clear conflicts in, in my former firm. And I'd say, OK, well, who's the client here? Well, it's XYZ Law Firm. Okay. Uh, that's, no, it's not XYZ Law Firm's intellectual property. It's their client's intellectual property. Law Firm just referred the case to us. Yeah, but they're our client. I said, well, you, they may be your client in a business sense. They may be your client in a colloquial sense. But in the, in the framework of the rules of professional conduct, in the ethics rules, they're not. Now, that doesn't mean they couldn't be. You could also make them a client. But just because of the fact that they're paying doesn't make them a client. Uh, perspective limitations on malpractice liability. I see some people put those in their engagement agreements. Uh, I don't know, I think that sends a big red flag to the clients and I have never done that. Or, uh, but in many jurisdictions, you can actually agree to, if there's enough consent and you put all the right, give all of the right notice to the client, you could literally um, seek to get a perspective limitation on the client's ability to sue you for malpractice. Think about that. In those jurisdictions that permit that, and it's many of them that actually do permit that in theory, and some do not as a matter of public policy. So state by state can be very different. Virginia allows it. Uh, New York doesn't allow it. Other states don't. There are some states that don't allow it. Um, Barring a client from filing an ethics complaint? Um, I don't think so. Um, there's no specific rule that says you can't bar a client. Let's say the, the, the situation isn't as silly as you might think. Let's say you have a dispute with your client. OK, and it's a bona fide dispute. It's a fee dispute, you know, whatever the amount is. And, the, and everybody settles up. All right, and what, what do you do when you settle? Everybody wants to settle this. They want peace. They want to be done. They want to know they can go home, and it's finished. World peace. We don't want to deal with anything else. So whatever things are in play, they're done. You've, you're giving up all of you, client, you know, for this amount of money. We're, you know, we're buying our way out of all of this stuff. But you can't do that and include in that provision in the settlement agreement a, a prohibition on counts or on the client from either filing from filing a bar complaint or had if the client had already filed a bar complaint um, to withdraw the bar complaint uh, or to or do to do something that's sort of a second first or second cousin to that such as you agree not to cooperate with um, bar counsel. Those types of provisions 
uh, will put you in a lot of hot water. And there's no specific rule, actually, that, that spells that out in that, that, in that detail. I wish there would be, by the way. It would make it easier. There's a specific rule that talks about limitations on, on waivers in advance for malpractice. And you would think, well, in the absence, you know, uh, in the absence of a specific rule, well, you've already discussed malpractice. You haven't said anything about bar complaints, so it must mean I can do it because it doesn't say that I can't do it. But the way it has been interpreted is that there's another rule called conduct prejudicial to the administration of justice. And under the penumbra of the conduct or the header of the conduct president, <laughs> prejudicial to the administration of justice, um, courts, bar authorities, pretty much uniformly said uh, that that sort of a deal is contrary and prejudices the interests of justice and uh, uh, will cause a lot of, uh, that is a type of a conflict of interest. So that's in, the, that's in the current client space. Remember, former clients, they've got, we have conflict duties to them too. Um, and the, the rule is narrower, um, but it, it, we need to be mindful of it. And that is that the representation of a client, of a new client, in a matter will be, it has to be a materially adverse to a former client. And there's that weasel word materially, but we'll deal with that. Um, and that the new matter is either the same or substantially related to the prior client, uh, the, the prior matter for the former client. And I've had those situations before where we've had to argue about, well, what is this related? Or was it substantially related? Well, how do you know? And I've, I've seen it in, this, in, the, in the context of, of patent representations where a, a law firm who has developed an expertise in a particular area of technology, and they really know this stuff very well, and they've you know, and they've been working on a client in a particular aspect of a particular technology, and then they go on and they stop representing that client, and then they represent another client in the same general technical space, but in something that might have a slightly different, you know, modification to what the original work was. It might be completely unrelated, at least from a technical perspective, but seeing judges try to divine that line between whether that work you're doing for the new client is substantially related to the work that you were doing from, for the old client is a matter of, well, it's, it's in the eyes of the beholder. It depends on what jurisdiction you are. Some judges will roll up their sleeves and dive into the claims and look at this. These are patentably distinct inventions and look at all of the differences are. They're not related. They're not substantially related. If they were, then this other guy would never have gotten a patent in the first place. Others have said, look, you know, you got this tech in you know, a particular field you're representing another client in, an, in, in, in a similar technical field, and it's directly adverse, and they'll call that uh, a conflict of interest. Again, the, the, the interest that is defined to be protected is the, the presumption that during the original representation of that, the now former client is that you, you gained knowledge of confidences, and um, the substantial relation test is the proxy for determining whether that information that you got from your former client could be used potentially adver advantageously to you or your new client in the new matter. Uh, good news, uh, most conflicts are waivable. There's a few glaring exceptions, the one being you can't represent both sides in a case. Uh, and you think, you know, you might chuckle and say like, well, who would ever do that, right? And I thought that too. <laughs> but I to share with you that I had a, a situation at one time in a former law firm of mine where a lawyer came to me from that law firm, a very senior partner in that law firm, and this individual was going to represent both sides in a proceeding, in an adversarial inter-parties proceeding, with both clients' consent, which was even the more bizarre, 
But his the, the, the rationalization was, well, I'm just going to be a local council. I'm like, well, <laughs> okay, <laughs> you can't. No, sorry. Everybody consents. Doesn't matter. You can't consent to that. It's just, it's just one of those. You just deal with it. Move on. Okay. You just can't do it. It's too weird, too. And we're not going to make the news by being the first law firm in the United States to violate that rule. Uh, uh, and oftentimes, and especially for those of us who have, have worked in bigger shops and or have seen engagement uh, letters, a lot of form engagement letters include language purporting to adv adv advance wave to some level of degree future conflicts of interest that were sort of unknown at the time that the relationship started. And, um, but the firm says, look, if you want us, then you've got to agree that uh, if something else comes down along the line and it's directly adverse to you, in an unrelated manner, it doesn't involve using your confidential information that you, you, would, you would waive the conflict and you consent to our representation of that other client. And clients will often sign those. Um, now, whether they're going to be enforced or not, that's a whole different story. And there's, um, we can spend an hour on just on uh, informed consent waivers of conflict of interest. All I'm doing is just illustrating that it's, it's an issue. It's, it's, it's potentially waivable. Commonly, people try to waive conflicts in advance. Um, sometimes they work, and sometimes they don't. So let's talk about some hypotheticals um, with, with that background in mind. Um, and this is just a very simple example of why it matters whether someone is former versus current. Um, uh, you, your firm represents company A, single trademark application. Company B comes along, sees another uh, meets another attorney in your firm. They just got sued for patent infringement. They want your firm to represent uh, them in this, you know, mega patent infringement case. There's going to be millions of dollars. This is going to keep everybody busy for, you know, years. Uh, uh, who's the defendant in that case? Oh, it's Company A. And you do your conflict check and say, well, oh, she, Company A is. Uh, representing them in this trademark application that we build a thousand dollars on and you know we're looking at you know potentially millions of dollars in in revenue I mean is how is that possibly a conflict trademarks are unrelated to patents so how can there be any problem well that's the difference between loyalty and confidentiality that in turn is the difference between whether the client was a former client or a current client, because if company A was in fact a former client at the time this new prospective representation came in, and it appears in fact that it is unrelated, and substantially so in fact, um, then it's, cool. it's okay. But if company A still in, hasn't gotten their registration yet, they're a current client. And unless they don't agree to waive, and everybody has to waive, not just company A, but um, company B as well. And if they don't waive, they don't want their current counsel to sue them uh, for patent infringement, then that is an issue. That would be a conflict under, for, for, under the current client rule just because of the duty of loyalty. So the duty of loyalty doesn't matter how much they're paying. They don't have to pay a penny. Okay, it could be pro bono, and you still have a duty of loyalty. So, or they could be, you know, just a poor paying client who are effectively getting pro bono representation. They don't. It doesn't matter the relative value in that. Whether it should or not is beyond the scope of this lecture. It's a different policy issue. But that's them's the rules. Um, the perpetual trademark client example. Firm is representing Smallco for a trademark application. And the trademark issues, registers, I guess is the proper word. Well, can the firm now represent Big Co in unrelated litigation against Smallco? Uh, the mark is already issued. Can the firm represent Big Co in that big patent case now against Smallco? Who thinks that 
um, the firm can take on the representation. Several hands, not many. Okay, so the rest of you agree that the firm can take on, or you just, come on, raise your hands if you want to. Come on, vote. It's okay. There's no wrong answers here. Um, so can they? Well, you know, that's, that's a good question. And this is a really, this, is, this gets, a, it gets kind of tricky. Because what happens, you, you may need to know more information. It may be true that this was a one and done. And this is assuming, of course, client A, or small co, doesn't have ongoing things going on. This was a one and done, literally. Um, but what if the firm is continuing to correspond with small co and keeps a regular conduct of communicating with the client, hey, by the way, we're going to dock it for a reminder for you. If you want to keep this registration in force, you've got to do this a period of time. We need you to file this. If you're still using, you can get it continued. Then, you know, so this can go on, right, for years and years and years. Um, so is, 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 is Smallco a current client in that context? I don't know. It's hard to say. Uh, I've, had that, I've had this argument many, 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 many times with people. And um, usually the answer that I get is whatever is in the most economic interest, the greatest economic interest of the firm is the, is the way we're going to go with it. Um, but it can be tricky. And there is, there is, there is risk involved with the not knowing when a client representation is actually ending or having ambiguity in terms of whether the, the client relationship or current is a current one or a former one, ambiguity is construed against the lawyer. You know, ties go to the runner. <laughs> ties go to the client. They don't need to go to the instant replay. If they have to go to the instant replay, the runner wins. The client wins. It can't. It shouldn't be that close. If it's a close call, you're not going to win that one. Um, and so it's an issue that needs to be dealt with. It needs to, it's, it's not an insurmountable issue, but it is an issue that you need to be thinking about when you're, when you're engaging your clients to, to realize, you know, is this, you know, are we just dating here? Is this just like a, you know, a, a, you know, a one-night thing? Or are we kind of like a, are we really in a committed relationship now? Are we, you know, are, are, are we in that type of a long-term relationship? And whatever the parties want to agree to, then they, they can do it. It's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Where, where the problem is is silence. Silence, not good. Ambiguity, bad. Silence, bad. Because the client's going to say, I thought you were my trademark counsel. You know, and they may be right, and you're going to have adv you're going to have judges who are going to look at it and say, "What did you do to put your client on notice that they aren't your client? Well, why did you keep sending them these things? Why did you keep communicating with them? Wouldn't a reasonable client believe that they had an attorney-client relationship with you? That they were that you were their concierge? So it can be an issue. I love this one because I've seen this happen too in the opinion world. Opinions are, are, are interesting beasts because, because, because oftentimes they, they're not isolated incidents of, you know, one and a done, that they have a, 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 a broader lifespan. And, and, and many times, frankly, we don't even know how broad the lifespan is. But you think of the situation where a client comes to you and they've asked for an opinion regarding a third party's patent, you know, invalidity, non-infringement, whatever. You do the opinion, get it out there, and then you don't hear anything. Okay, six months go by or so, and then they, the client comes back to you and says, oh, remember that opinion you did? Okay, we've got some new information now. We've, you know, we've tweaked this part of our design. We need you to, uh, you know, to renew your opinion to see how it, we're looking under this redesign. So picks it up, does the new opinion a year after that. Maybe it happens again. It could continue to happen a couple of times. These things do have a, they, you know, they don't always have a very natural breaking point. There's sort of this little bit of a door is left open 
I mean, frankly, as counsel, it's much easier to get business from existing clients than it is to get it from a new client. So in a way, we're economically incentivized to keep that door open. You know, do you want to send that client a notice after you send them that opinion that says, OK, thank you. We're, our relationship is now concluded. Thank you very much. If you'd like to renew that relationship, you know, we will do a new engagement and everything is going to be great. Does, is that People don't typically like to send those types of correspondence. They want to keep the door open. All This is a good way to get clients. Um, but in this situation, can the firm sue small co? And then again, it depends. Is it, a, is it a current client? Is it a former client? How do we know? What's going to be the guidepost? It's going to be very fact intensive. And fact intensive is bad. Okay, <laughs> if you're going to get into a fact dispute, those don't work out very well. You know, it gets involved. You might end up winning, ultimately winning, but there's a price to success, and it's it's not cheap. Um, but it's uh, it's it's a question that needs to be thought through, and and there are strategies to help mitigate that type of risk where you don't have to have that sort of maybe broad. You know, blunt, okay, we're done now type communication, which some clients might find off-putting, to say the least. Um, but there's other ways to do that, such as building it into an engagement letter that they probably won't read anyway. And there's a clause in there that says, okay, when this particular matter is done, then it is done, and you become a former client. And, you know, hey, they've got a duty to read, and if they don't understand it, they can, you know, it's it's not an unreasonable term to define when the scope of the representation ends. It's actually a quite reasonable thing to include. Um, but if you don't say it, again, ambiguity, bad. So we're talking about some more issues that kind of come up that, that we've seen before, and, and it's, there's been some discussion about it in, in media. Um, not this particular pat fact pattern, but something like it. Let's say you have an inventor client uh, comes to a lawyer, says, Look, I got this great idea. I want to, I've got an improved rubber for automotive tires. Okay, improved rubber for automotive. Who is the Porsche driver on the, um, on the um, Autobahn who spoke earlier? Our last speaker who spoke about their trip on the Autobahn. This would be a great invention for for the Porsche on the Autobahn. And as, a, as an aside, by the way, I, last year I got a speeding ticket on the Autobahn. So I don't know, I want to get one of those signs that say no speed limit on it, but I actually got a speeding ticket. And they, good luck trying to collect. But um, <laughs> I, keep, I keep getting these letters in German <laughs> that I can't read other than the, the, the line that says 135 euro to send to somebody. but. Um, so far, I've been advised that it, I could blow it off. Uh, <laughs> I haven't been to Germany since, so I'm not testing that rule. Um, so Ivan, no, so Ivan is the inventor. He calls the lawyer, lawyer's great, comes over, meets with Ivan. And there's another guy there, Smith. Smith's his partner, his business partner. They've came up with this thing together, right? They've been working on it. Um, they both say, you know, we want you to draft up an application. They give them a disclosure. Uh, they say, you know, this is the greatest thing, and it's going to be a standard in the automotive industry. Um, so did we say that? We don't even know at this point. Oh, yes, we did. Ivan and Smith, I forgot to mention this important fact. Ivan and Smith, before you met with them, they incorporated. They created Small Co. Okay, that was their company to commercialize their invention. So we've got... Ivan, the inventor, we've got Smith, the inventor, we've got Smallco, this company. But who's, who's Larry's client? Is it, is it Ivan, the inventor? Who thinks that Ivan, the inventor, is, is Larry, the lawyer's client? I bet the inventors in the room think that Ivan, <laughs> that the lawyer is their, is their lawyer, right? And, and how about Smith? He didn't even know Smith. Smith was just there. He was just in the room. But he was part of the discussion, and there didn't seem to be any. They shared all of this information. Is Smith the, is Smith the client? Or, oh my god, there's Smallco. What 
the hell is Smallco? And what are they? Are they the client? And it could it possibly be that Smallco is actually the only client? And the inventors aren't even the clients, even though they're the ones that called you and hired you and are paying you? Is that possible? Yeah, it's possible. It happens all the time. But a lot of people don't understand that, and it comes up. And you would be, well, maybe you wouldn't be surprised, but I am sometimes surprised by that, but it just happens. You run across these people that, again, when you're crossing that bridge, they come into your space, they come into your life. Here was this Ivan guy, and now all of a sudden there's this Smith guy. And now I've got this other, you know, is it Ivan, is it Smith, is it Smallco? I've got to figure that out. Is there a duty to assign? Well, if there's a duty to assign, then it would probably be Smallco would be the client in interest, in which case Ivan and Smith might not be clients at all. Or maybe they are. What did you tell them? Did you tell them that they weren't your clients? Did they think that you're your clients? I mean, Jesus, they signed a power of an attorney. Isn't that the sin qua non of defining a client representation? Is a power? That's what I used to think, actually, that the power of attorney. So how could you say that you're not a client when you empowered me to be your attorney? What else are you? <laughs> what other possible label can I put? But there have been cases at the federal circuit which have held in certain factual contexts, especially this is the, like in the corporate invention context, that, yeah, the power of attorney is sort of a formality, and the inventors themselves have to file these part of this part of the application. They have to file an inventor's oath, but the, uh, the but the but the owner is the client. The owner is the assignee. The owner is the applicant. But at least at this point, it's ambiguous. And an argument could be made um, by any one of these that they thought that, they, that you were their individual attorney. Now, again, could you have represented? Can you represent all of them? Well, sure you can. There's nothing that says you can't. There's nothing inherently conflicting right now between Ivan and Smith and Smolka. They all seem to be on the same page. They want the same thing. Um, so that's OK. You can represent joint clients. That's not per se unethical. But you've got to think about that, what that means. We're going to get into that in a second. And also, the other thing you need to know with these guys is, OK, well, they're talking about getting a patent. But a patent where? And for how long? Because of, are they going international, or is it just domestic? Are we expected to be doing a, you know, a world patenting, US patenting? Is there some temporal scope? Are we agreeing to do continuations and divisionals and other family members and counterparts? Or is it just this application and that's it and it's just this one case and we're one and done? If we don't know, we don't know. It could evolve over time that our, the scope of our representation expands to include those other things. But at least at this part, point in time, we just don't know what the limits are. As I said, we can represent joint clients. The issue with joint clients often becomes, though, well, who, do you, who are you taking instructions from? Because you're, you're representing multiple people at the same time. Uh, you know, if you've got to go, and they're both, they both have equal status. It's not like, you know, you're just a piddly client and you're the important client and I'm only going to listen to you, important client. This other client is important, too. So, but who gets to speak for, on behalf of the clients? Do it, if, you don't, if you don't have it already worked out in advance, some sort of a communication protocol, you might have to go to client A, and then you might have to go to client B and say, what do you think? And what do you think? Are we all in agreement? Are we all going to, is there going to be a disagreement over this? I have to run everything past there. It could become impractical. And then think about it, if you've got multiple, even more clients involved in this particular project, it becomes... Um, very cumbersome. So to be able to communicate effectively and understand what it is that, that your clients jointly want to do, you want to kind of put that off on the clients. You don't want to be the one making that call. You clients get together, figure it out what it is that you want, and then tell me what it is that you want as speaking for the group. And then I can give you legal advice that speaks on behalf of everybody, but at least it doesn't put me in the position of, of wondering whether my two joint clients are actually on the same page if I haven't spoken with them about it. Unless you want to keep calling all of these people and running every single thing by them. Um, 
The other issue that comes up with the client is what we touched on before, is that the entity client. Often it is the entity that is the client. And when a lawyer is retained by an organization, and it doesn't have to be a corp, it could be a partnership, it could be an informal arrangement, but if a lawyer is retained by an organization, then the lawyer is, generally speaking, the lawyer is representing the organization. And it's not, and those people who speak on behalf of that organization, there's a term that the ethics rules use for that. They're called constituents. So they are the speakers. Since an, a juristic entity can't speak for itself, it has to speak through its people. It's got to speak through its counsel. It's got to speak through its, its officers, its employees. So that doesn't make everybody in the company your individual client necessarily. Necessarily is the key. Um, where things can get really tricky, though, is when you're dealing especially with smaller entities, the small co's of the world, um, when you're dealing very closely with the, you know, key players in the company, the officers, the managers, the directors, um, when you're dealing with the inventors, when you're sitting down meeting with the inventors and you're getting the disclosures from the inventors, does the inventor realize that you're not personally representing their interests? That you're actually representing the interests of the person to whom that inventor was, is obligated to assign their invention? Um, shareholders, you've got issues with in deposition practice of if it's a 30B6 deposition versus an individual deposition, are you representing the entity or are you representing the individual? All I'm suggesting is that these are issues that you need to think through when you're going on this path with these clients and you've got to understand who is what and who are you answering to. So here's another uh, hypothetical. Uh, the conflict check, conflict check. So this is back with uh, Larry the lawyer and uh, he got this idea from his inventor clients. The inventor clients have, uh, you know, have this standard rubber thing for the automotive industry. And they do a conflict check and it turns out the, the firm is representing Ford. All right, uh, but it's representing Ford in employment litigation. Um, so the question then is, well, okay, does this represent a conflict? Well, well, first of all, let me think, ask you, do you think it's a conflict? Anyone here think that there's a conflict of interest for the firm to represent an inventor to get what they think will be an industry standard automotive tire rubber invention at the same time that they are representing um, one of the major automotive manufacturers in the world? Anyone think that that's a conflict at all? Could be, I mean, potentially. It, Ask Ford. <laughs> ask Ford. No, seriously. If you ask Ford if they think it's a conflict, I, I, I think I know what the answer would probably be. Um, they might have a different view. Because one would say, well, what? but Ford isn't specifically targeted. And I think in this scenario, the right answer is it's probably not a conflict because there is no direct adversity. They're not saying we're targeting Ford per se. Ford wasn't even mentioned. This is, we think that this is going to be an application that's going to be useful and maybe even a standard in the industry. But, you know, whether it goes against Ford or not, you know, that's kind of speculative at this point. Um, is there a significant risk that the representation would be materially limited by the firm's duties to Ford? And again, in this context, well, you know, we're dealing with this materially limited weasel word, but um, is it a significant risk that this that somehow that this that your duties to Ford in this uh, employment litigation is somehow going to be uh, affect how diligent you work on on this patent that's related to tire rubber? Probably not. Probably not. It's it's a little bit there, but this is where you get into these issues of sort of significant risk versus an insignificant risk, and the judgment call on that could be you know one where you may have different people that. Um, come to different conclusions. Oh God, and then there's the family conflicts, and this is, just drives people crazy, especially me. Uh, oftentimes we represent entities, and oftentimes those entities aren't just 
isolated singular entities, but they are part of the corporate family. And sometimes those corporate family trees are awfully broad and they could be global and they can be, you know, they can have subs and parents and sisters and cousins. It's a whole thing, right? So do you represent, so you represent the, the, the sub, the sub that has approached you, the sub that wants to do work for you, that, that you're doing work for, or are you representing the entire Ford family when you are taking on that representation of the Ford subsidiary. And, and that is an ugly, ugly, ugly analysis to have to go to. And it, it gets complicated by, well, it will get complicated by client relationships because again, you can darn well bet that a large sophisticated company is gonna have a very broad view on who your client relationship with is and they're gonna believe that if you represent one, you represent all whereas you may not want that. Um, there was a case uh, actually th earlier this year from the Federal Circuit called uh, Dr. Falk and where this, this issue came out as to whether or not uh, an attorney could be disqualified because of a conflict because he represented uh, an affiliated entity to the, uh, at the adverse uh, party was an affiliate of a corporate client. And the, the court found that there, there, there was a conflict and disqualified the, uh, the law firm from representing before the Federal Circuit. And the, the source of the conflict was not the engagement agreement, it was the, the company's outside counsel guidelines, which were adopted in, in, were required to be adopted, accepted as part of the deal with the client. If you're gonna represent us, you have to agree to abide by these outside counsel guidelines. How many of you all, deal with clients that have outside counsel, outside counsel guidelines. It's very common, right? And, and while those terms, maybe, maybe you can negotiate with them, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe, but probably not. And, you know, most, most of us just have to, you know, realize what it is that we're taking on. When we're, when we're agreeing to outside counsel guidelines, who we are representing can be all of a sudden comes from being this, we thought we were just representing you, but it turns out, you know, we're representing all. So outside counsel guidelines, terrific fodder for problems for, for us if, we don't, if we're not paying attention to them. So, okay, fine. I don't want to represent somebody that the duty of loyalty problem anyway. And uh, I heard in this lecture that McCabe gave that if it was a Former client, I could go adverse to a former client as long as it's not substantially related. Um, I, want to, uh, I want to do something that's adverse to uh, a current client, but I can't do that um, because they're a current client. So, well, here's what I can do. Why don't we just change that current client to a former client? We'll say, uh, you know, sorry, we can't represent you anymore. Uh, we've got great replacement counsel for you. We're shipping your case off to somebody else. Nice doing business with you. And the next day, you sign your engagement agreement with new company, which is a far more attractive and <laughs> is the new model. And, you know, lo and behold, you take an action adverse to your former client who you divorced in that situation. Well, is that okay? Can you then, with knowledge of a prospective uh, uh, new matter, with, with knowledge of that, is, is it okay to drop the client, make them, turn them into a former client, and so that then you can take on the case? Anyone think that that's okay? Okay. Anyone think that that's not okay? Yeah, the, the, a lot of the ethics authorities, you won't find this language in any rules, but there's a, actually a, a doctrine that has evolved or some people like to use it. It's called the hot potato doctrine. You can't drop a client like a hot potato to, to turn them from a current client to a former client. But what you can do, and this isn't improper at all, is plan. And, and firms that are really smart and want to avoid these issues, plan. They look at their clients, they look at where their, you know, where their space is, 
who are they getting business from, um, where they see other opportunities, and they may decide as a, part, as a matter of strategic planning, you know what, we don't have anything currently right now that's a problematic, but these guys could be problematic sometime in the future. Um, you know, they've got business interests that are, you know, related to our other clients, and we may not want to have these folks around for various reasons. And in that particular situation, there wouldn't necessarily be anything wrong with, with turning that client into a former client, assuming you can withdraw from the representation in an ethical manner, and oftentimes you can, with the exceptions of litigation where you need to get court approval. Um, but in a planning mode where you're not specifically dropping the client with knowledge that there's going to be this case that's going to hop in your desk the next day, but just as more as a matter of strategic planning. I've seen that work, and that seems to be um, legally effective. So what happens when uh, you're dealing with these individual inventors? We're going back to Ivan and Smith, our two inventor clients. And um, Smith is the one who's you know always calling the lawyer and he's telling him what to do and the lawyer's just doing what he does and Smith tells Larry the lawyer to amend his patent claims and uh, just so happens that by following Smith's instructions um, and the lawyer doesn't consult with Ivan about it he just does what Smith says amends the claims and lo and behold because inventorship is defined by the scope of the claims whatever the happened to be the contribution that that Smith, that uh, uh, that Ivan made, are now they're not part of the claims anymore. He's no longer an inventor. He might want, think he's an inventor, uh, but if you're looking at the scope of the claims and his inventive contribution isn't found anywhere in those claims, let's say he's been amended out. Okay, um, the result is Ivan is not a co-inventor anymore. Is that a problem? Could that be a problem? Well, it could be a problem, is the, is the answer. It potentially is a significant problem. If you are dealing in the situation where you've got multiple clients and you don't have that clear path of communication in terms of who's instructing you, because if it was on the one hand, if the agreement was, I do what Smith says, Smith speaks for both of you, I'm not getting into it, you guys decide, and I'm just following Smith. But if you don't have that, then there is that independent duty of going back to both and saying, look, you know, this is what he wants me to do. Um, uh, and Ivan might say, well, what's the effect of that on me? Do, do, should I care? Well, other than the fact that you are no longer inventor, no, it's fine. Uh, that, Ivan might balk at that. He might want to throw in a dependent claim or something, at least to give him some foothold into the inventorship world, whereas Smith himself may be doing this intentionally because he's got some bigger picture that he wants to, you know, his co-inventor sort of out of the picture. Did Larry breach a duty of loyalty to his client? It's possible. There was a case a couple of years ago in an OED disciplinary case where this, this kind of situation played out in a trademark context where there were multiple, two trademark owners. And it was a long story, but basically the lawyers followed the instructions of one client that adversely affected the interest of the joint owner of the trademark, who they never communicated with about the changes that effectively gave that other joint owner, uh, took them off of the ownership trail of the, of the registration. And, um, and it ended up with, with uh, license suspensions for the lawyers that were involved. These are good lawyers from a good law firm. So it's not like these things happen to, you know, schlocks, you know. Even good, well-intentioned people, they, you know, people make mistakes. And it wasn't a long suspension, but it was still a suspension. And um, I've never heard anyone say that they're really happy about a short suspension. But, you know, it, it, it wasn't a good thing. And it was a matter of not appreciating who they're speaking with, who, is, who they're taking instructions from. Here's an issue. I'm just going to leave this with you all because it drives everybody crazy in the patent space, and I still haven't found a good answer for it, but, you know, you're representing a client and during prosecution of a, of a patent application or a trademark application, killer prior art cited by the office, then you look on the face of the prior art and lo and behold, it's a, the reference appears to be a, a, a reference owned by another firm client. Or 
the reference is something that your firm prosecuted. Your firm's name is on it. Does that ring any bells for anybody? Should at least anybody know that that raises a red flag? You should at least know. If you learn nothing else from this, you should at least understand. Please understand. It could raise a red flag. I'm not saying it can't. It will, but it could. It should be something to be mindful of. Is it always going to be the case? No, it's not always going to be the case. But it is, uh, but it is something that you can't just mindlessly, you've got to take a look at what it is that you're asking to argue. Because if you're going to argue, and I've had this discussion with clients before, well, we're not saying anything bad about the art. We're just distinguishing the art. Well, but if you're distinguishing the art, you're making it admission. And maybe you're narrowing. Maybe you're saying that the art that's your client's patent should be construed narrowly. You know, that could be problematic. That could be one of those material limitation type issues. Subject matter conflicts. This is the kind of the, the, the round, uh, round up here. I don't want to, uh, under, I don't want to uh, keep you all here longer than you have to because I know, okay, I still have five minutes, good. Um, Subject matter conflicts. This is another very tricky subject. Firm is representing Ford for, bra for patents relating to improved braking system. It's an EM uh, invention. Small Co. comes back, says, firm, I want you to represent me on this improved rubber for automotive and ve other vehicle tires. It's chemical patent, process patent. Is this a conflict? Is this a conflict in the subject matter? The Subject matter conflicts doctrine, if you will. I don't know if it really has established that framework work, but it has came up in a case four years ago against Finnegan Henderson that represented two different clients that both had, um, that were both simultaneously getting patents in the quote unquote same technical space. And that same technical space happened to be the manner in which eyeglasses uh, and frames are connected together without screws. One client did it one way, another client did it a different way. Both clients got their patents issued. All seemed well until client number two, Mr. Malling said, hey, I just found out that you've got this other patent for client number one. And because of that, I lost all of these business opportunities and now I can't market my invention and I want $100 million. And you laugh. You laugh at, no one at Finnegan was laughing. Believe me, this is not a funny thing <laughs> for them. This resulted in years of litigation. And it was finally resolved in Finnegan's favor. But for the large part, because both clients, everybody got their patents. The, the supreme judicial, and this is a scary thing too. Who decided this particular issue as to whether there was a subject matter, there was a subject matter conflict in technical subject matter? Was it the Federal Circuit? With exclusive jurisdiction on patent matters, was a federal court that has exclusive jurisdiction in patent matters? No, it's the Massachusetts Supreme Court, which doesn't have any jurisdiction in patent matters, but they do in malpractice actions because of a Supreme Court case that says legal malpractice that arises in patents doesn't really implicate patent law, even though it kind of does. Um, but you know, the, 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 the message from this was that, well, Finnegan, okay, they were able to show, distinguish, there wasn't, a, there wasn't a conflict amongst the subject matter, but what the Supreme Judicial Court of um, Massachusetts said is that, you know, what you guys need, you all in the IP space, and this, uh, some of you may have been in firms that uh, supported Finnegan's amicus brief that was filed with the Massachusetts Supreme Court, because Massachusetts Supreme Court basically gave what they did, which was actually very helpful, was instead of getting into this, what's the general space or type of invention, competing space, some vague term at 50,000 feet, they said, no, you've got to look at the claimed invention, not just general subject matter, but what do the claims say? And are those, are those claims overlapping such that, you know, if there were interferences that this could be you know, actually the same invention, the same claimed invention, or if they're so close that they're just obvious variations with one another. But other than that, if it's not a general subject matter conflict unless you've got these substantially overlapping claims. And 
What's the best proof that they didn't have substantially overlapping claims? The PTO. Both clients got their own patents. Pretty good proof, and it, and it worked at the, at, in Massachusetts. What the, the, the court did so say, and it, it, it sent out a warning. I don't know how many people got the warning, but the, the, what the, the teaching point was that law firms have to have in their co conflict checking system some way of accounting for the subject matter so that you can identify potential subject matter conflicts. And so firms that have been paying attention to this issue have been evolving in their development of systems and processes that are apt to at least try to um, uh, find ways in which uh, patented technologies for different clients are so close to one another that they can actually create a, a true conflict of interest. And by the way, the, even though this was the Massachusetts case, um, uh, and the USPTO is not bound by Massachusetts law, um, I have been in meetings with the Office of Enrollment and Discipline, and they sure as heck follow Malling. They believe that that's the appropriate standard, at least that's what I've been told. And, and when I have, but when the OED asks me or for my client the question of what is your client's process for identifying subject matter conflicts of interest as per Malling versus Finnegan Henderson, if that's the question, and I've gotten that question before, and if the client's answer is, say what? <laughs> the what, the what, the subject matter what? That's, that's a really, that's not a good answer. That, that answer needs to be checked. So it's expected that we have what's called a conflict check, not just a conflict check system, a robust conflict checking system, which we don't know what a robust conflict checking system means other than it's robust. But I would submit that having one, whatever it is, in some way, shape, or form, at least having one, you're going to be way better off than 90% of the people. It may, there's not going to be a perfect conflict checking system. But it's about putting best efforts, reasonable efforts, of having a conflict check in, in place. We talked about the settlement issue. You can't settle away your uh, rights. And I've, I'm, I'm right about at the end of my time here. I've got my at the end of my time here. All right, we'll just get, give about. So the one takeaway from all of this, the only one thing if you can remember from any of this is that almost all of these issues that I've talked about um, are things that can be uh, dealt with upfront when you're dealing with the client, when you're starting the engagement, when you're getting into it. These are the types of things that you should be thinking about. And, and when you're getting engaged, you should have an engagement agreement. I know some firms still don't like to use engagement agreements. I don't understand it because the engagement agreement is the contract, and you can set forth the terms and the conditions. You can define who the client is. You can define when the representation ends. You can define the scope of the representation. You can define all of these parameters, even with respect to subject matters, and, and have this all cleared out so that everybody, as we go along the path, and we're working together with our clients, that these you know, unanticipated or in troubling conflicts of interest don't pop up in the middle uh, and interfere badly with our lives and make all of those bad things that I talked about before come happen to you. So the engagement agreement is the one that you should have. A good conflicts checking system is one that you should have. Everybody should be well trained on it. People in your firm need to know about it. Clients should be aware of it as well. And if you've done that, you're going to be way ahead of your competitors. You're going to be way ahead of everybody else. And you're probably not going to be needing my services, which is all fine. Um, and, um, and so I, I want to thank you all for spending the last hour and 15 minutes on your Friday afternoon with me. I appreciate it very much.